I'm Stephen Rinella, host of the Meat Eater podcast and the Netflix original series Meat Eater. As a hunter and wildlife enthusiast, the question comes up, how can you justify killing and eating animals that you love and protect? Well, that's part of what we wrangle with on the Meat Eater podcast, along with broader and often funnier discussions about living an outdoor life in the modern world. Listen to the Meat Eater podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Monster, DC Sniper, a production of iHeartRadio and Tenderfoot TV. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent those of iHeartMedia, Tenderfoot TV, or their employees. Listener discretion is advised. October 19th, 8 p.m., Ashland, Virginia. 37-year-old Jeffrey Hopper was walking with his wife, Stephanie. They were in the parking lot outside a Ponderosa Steakhouse when a shot rang out from the woods. Tim Meacham was the first officer on the scene. In 2002, I was a uh, patrol officer with the Ashland Police Department. We're walking in the parking lot of the Ponderosa. Right. So put me back in, in the time and space. Walk me through it. Um, I had received a call for a stolen or a lost cell phone. So I was taking that report a couple miles south of here. And he was asking, you know, what have you heard about this whole sniper thing? And I was like, you know, I, I've heard as much as you have. I get the news. And he looked at me and says, it wouldn't it be something if that guy came here? And he had just finished saying that when dispatch handed me the call. And they said, respond to 817 England Street for a possible shooting. I, I looked at him like, no way. And the look on his face was priceless. You know, just like, oh my gosh, what did I just do to you? I marked in route, told him I was on my way. They said, we've had one call, uh, we've got a mail down in the parking lot at the Ponderosa. I asked him if there's any other information. And they said, no new calls, no new information. And that's when I called the sergeant on the radio and I said, we may want to consider starting the response plan. When I arrived, our victim was laying in the parking lot, and his wife was sitting on the sidewalk and had her husband's head in her lap. I pulled past them right to the end of the sidewalk here, and my car acted as a shield between the woods and the hoppers. So instinctively, you just pull your car into a position that sets up a barrier between the wooded area and potentially more victims. Yes. Jeff was laying in the parking lot, and Stephanie was sitting on the sidewalk, and she was holding pressure on his stomach. I told her that I needed to verify the injury, so she lifted up the towel that she was holding on. And I saw a pole about the size of a nickel in the top of the victim's stomach. I feel somebody tap me on the shoulder. I wasn't expecting anybody. I turn around, a guy standing there is a little bit shorter than me. He had a chain around his neck, he reached into his shirt, he pulled it out, and it was a New York Police Department badge. He says, I'm retired, what do you need? If there was somebody still here, I wanted them to think that we were searching for them. I asked him to use the spotlight on my car to pan back and forth across the woods. And I showed him where the shotgun release was in my car and told him that, hey, if shots are fired, send lead that way. There is a ruthless person on the loose. What unnerves this community the most is the randomness of the murders. Ordinary people doing ordinary things. They killed the five people in one day and then went on the rampage for the next month. It is quite a mystery. The police say they have never had a crime quite like this. Be careful. These guys are using weapons that are going to go right straight through our bulletproof vests. There's a white van just went by with two guys in it. From iHeartRadio and Tinderfoot TV, this is Monster, DC Sniper. Jeff and Stephanie. Describe the two of them and how they were working through this very serious situation together. She was the calmest person I've ever seen on any type of major scene like this. And when you have somebody that's bleeding internally like that, their heart rate is up, their blood pressure is up, it can make them bleed out a little bit faster. But Jeff was laying there just staying really calm. I told her, I said, okay, the best thing to do for a bleed is just to hold pressure, and it's not rocket science. She started to chuckle, the victim started to laugh, and I, at this point I'm like, okay, can you guys let me in on the joke? Well, she was a rocket scientist for NASA. So me telling her that it wasn't rocket science, uh, she kind of knew that already. And they actually told me that they were in Pennsylvania visiting family. Intentionally, they didn't stop in Maryland, D.C. or Northern Virginia because of the shootings. And they felt like if they stopped closer to Richmond, that it would be safer. So the ambulance, when they come up on scene, normally wait until law enforcement can make sure the scene is safe for them to enter. I couldn't do that. So we came up with a different plan for them to come in and pick up Jeff. I got my shotgun. I told the driver of the ambulance to stay in the driver's seat. I had the crew of the ambulance come out of the back of the ambulance. Um, I had them park right behind my car, bumper to bumper, so that the ambulance itself was also some type of barricade. They get Jeff on the stretcher, they put him in the ambulance, and we get them out onto England Street and tell them to take the shoulder of Interstate 95 because we'd shut it down. 
By 8.30, the victim was arriving at the hospital and police across this area had activated a coordinated tactical response, a plan put in place just last week in the event of a suspected sniper attack. Very quickly, traffic was brought to a complete stop. That's retired Maryland State Police Lieutenant David Reichenbaugh. Ordinarily, if you do that, you've got phone calls going to politicians. Hey, what's, what's going on? Why are the roads blocked? I can't get home. I can't go about my business. But believe it or not, at this point, the public was completely on board with, with law enforcement. They were in fear. They wanted this stopped as badly as we did. The roadblocks turned up nothing. The sniper had vanished once again. But there was good news. Thanks to the efforts of first responders, Jeffrey Hopper survived the attack. Once we got Jeff in the ambulance, we got the crime scene tape out, and we just, right in front of the Ponderosa, right on England Street, we taped from one side of the building to the other. From that point, it seemed like every three-letter agency in the federal government was starting to show up. I had FBI show up. I had ATF show up. One of those ATF agents was Ray Neely. I'm a normal special agent. Well, I meant <laughs> a relatively normal special agent. You know, I'm so used to hanging around law enforcement. Special agents are kind of a dime a dozen. And I was based out of Washington, so it's not very impressive in that particular area anyway. Ray Neely was a canine handler for the ATF. In 2002, during the sniper investigation, I handled a dog named Garrett. He was a yellow lab. At that point, he was about seven years old. We use the term explosive detection canines. That's their official title. In the public, you'll just hear them called bomb dogs. It's been estimated that there's over 19,000 different types of explosive formulations, but generally they can be broken down into seven families. So as long as you train across those seven families, the dogs can then find firearms as well as explosives. On the night of October 19th, after Jeffrey Hopper was shot, the ATF sent Ray Neely to investigate the woods outside the Ponderosa. When we arrived that evening, it was actually kind of a balmy night, and uh, because we're working in low light, the human search was really not going to be effective, so they were going to wait till daybreak. I talked to the people on scene and said, hey, it's best that we deploy this evening. The dog doesn't need daylight to work, and the odor signature is stronger now than it's going to be tomorrow morning. There was a wooded lot behind the Ponderosa. It's all pitch black dark. When any human or animals move through wooded areas, they typically go through the area of least resistance. It's called lines of drift. If there's briars, people are going to avoid that. They're going to go a different path. And so in this particular wooded area, I saw maybe three or four of these little breaks in the wood line. You know, there were animal trails or maybe kids played in those woods. So I was going to search those first. And then if that failed, then I would start doing more of a gridded search. It was only on my second path of least resistance that I saw the dog change behavior. The dog started tracking until he went to a particular spot, and then he alerted me. I went over with my flashlight and examined the area where he looked, and that's when I saw the rub mark. There was a small tree about maybe two inches in diameter with a small vine, and when I looked up that tree, it looked like someone had taken some type of hard object and leaned it up against that tree, and that created a rub mark. You wouldn't have that occurring in nature. You needed something hard pressing against it. And it was also in line of sight to where the person was actually hit as he exited the uh, Ponderosa. And so that rub mark was someone probably using that tree as a rifle rest. I knew that the type of rifle more than likely would eject that shell casing to the right rear. So I deployed the dog off to my right rear, you know, hoping to find that shell casing. Again, I saw him change of behavior. Now he's going directly to source. He was probably 20 feet away. And when he alerted this time, I went over with my flashlight. Those shell casings can disappear in the ground pretty quick. The leaves have fallen off the trees at that point. But I actually saw the shell casing. It was sitting right on top, you know, pristine. But to the rear of where the shell casing was found, there was some type of message attached to a tree. I'm Stephen Rinella, host of the Meat Eater podcast and the Netflix original series Meat Eater. As a hunter and wildlife enthusiast, the question comes up, how can you justify killing and eating animals that you love and protect? Well, that's part of what we wrangle with on the Meat Eater podcast, along with broader and often funnier discussions about living an outdoor life in the modern world. Listen to the Meat Eater podcast on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. In the woods outside the Ponderosa Steakhouse, ATF agent Ray Neely found a spent shell casing, along with another clue, one that would prove vital to solving the case. There was a message that was attached to a tree. Investigators found a Ziploc bag pinned to a tree with two thumbtacks, and inside there was a letter. Investigators wanted to read the note, but they couldn't just open the bag at the crime scene and risk contaminating the evidence. An FBI helicopter was brought in that evening to take that piece of evidence directly to the lab. They would you know, be looking for DNA, any fingerprints. The letter arrived at the lab the next morning. Sunday, October 20th. When investigators finally opened it, they were shocked by what they found. 
Here's Maryland State Police Lieutenant David Reichenbaugh. Again, the snipers did not want the press notified about this. And for the first time, we were actually successful in preventing that. There was a couple significant things about this note. The first one was it was handwritten. And within a few hours, the handwriting on the tarot card that had been found a few days before was matched. So we knew we had the same individual. And any thought that it was organized terrorism pretty much got shot down and went out the window. The note had little red stars. And when I say stars, if you've ever had a child that went to a daycare and they bring their papers home and they did something great, the teachers put little silvery or gold or the red stars on top of their papers. That's what I'm talking about. And no self-respecting terrorist is going to do that, number one. Number two, we finally get a demand. Here's what the snipers wrote in the letter. For you, Mr. Police, call me God. Do not release to the press. We have tried to contact you to start negotiation, but the incompetence of your forces. These people took our call for a hoax or a joke. The letter then listed five people the sniper had contacted. One, Montgomery Police Officer Derek. Two, Rockville Police Department, female officer. Three, Task Force FBI, female. Four, Priest at Ashland. Five, CNN, Washington, D.C. These people took our call for a hoax or joke, so your failure to respond has cost you five lives. If stopping the killing is more important than catching us now, then you will accept our demands, which are non-negotiable. Option one, you will place $10 million in a Bank of America account. The letter then listed the information for a credit card, which belonged to a woman named Jill Lynn Farrell, and then it went on. We will have unlimited withdrawal at any ATM worldwide. You will activate the bank account, credit card, and PIN number. At 6 a.m. Sunday morning, we will contact you at Ponderosa Buffet, Ashland, Virginia, telephone number. You have until 9 a.m. Monday morning to complete transaction. Try to catch us withdrawing, at least you will have less body bags. But, option two, if trying to catch us now is more important, then prepare your body bags. If we give you our word, that is what takes place. Word is bond. P.S. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. The letter was a bombshell, and it left investigators with a slew of new questions. Was all this killing just about money? And if the snipers themselves had called into the tip lines and had been ignored, what other tips might have slipped through the cracks? But the letter did provide some major leads, like a list of people the sniper had called. Law enforcement would need to interview those people. And investigators needed to find the credit card owner, Jill Lynn Farrell. How was she connected to the snipers? Most importantly, though, the snipers wanted to talk, and police were eager to get them on the line. But there was a problem. The letter said the snipers would call the Ponderosa Steakhouse at 6 a.m., but by the time the police read the letter, they'd already missed the deadline. So Chief Moose reached out to the snipers the only way he knew how, through the media. To the person who left us a message at the Ponderosa last night, you gave us a telephone number. We do want to talk to you. Call us at the number you provided. Police had the phone company redirect the Ponderosa's number to a line in their command center. There, an FBI negotiator sat and waited, hoping the snipers would call. Meanwhile, agents were setting up a trap. They'd mapped out all of the payphones in the Richmond area and stationed police officers at locations nearby those phones, but out of sight. Police were ready to trace the sniper's call, identify which phone it came from, and then swarm that area with officers. Back at the command center, the phone began to ring. Hello? Is this Ponderosa? Uh, let's call it, please. Uh, all right, for Rob. Okay, um, let me give you a new number. Hello? Yeah, is this Ponderosa? Uh, who's calling, please? Joe. Okay, who are you calling for? Who am I calling for? Right. I'm calling to see if you guys are open. Hello? Hello. This is an automated reminder call from Pepsi Direct. Your Pepsi Direct sales representative will be contacting you shortly for today's order. After dozens of false alarms, the next morning, on Monday, October 21st, at 7.57 a.m., the sniper's call finally came. Hello? Hello? Yes. Is this the Ponderosa? Um, who is that? Don't say anything. Just listen. The sniper then held a tape recorder up to the payphone and hit play. <laughs> Through the phone, the audio was distorted and unintelligible. The call lasted just 38 seconds. But for some reason, the negotiator didn't alert others about the call for another six minutes. U.S. Marshals traced the call to a payphone just outside an Exxon station in West Richmond. At 8.07, now a full 10 minutes after the sniper's call, the Marshals notified local FBI of the address, and the trap sprung into motion. Don Nielsen worked just down the street from the Exxon where the snipers made the call. He saw the takedown happen. Part of my job in the morning, I got there early and you know, turned on the lights, made coffee for the customers, and that's when I saw everything going on right out front of the dealership. I just opened the front door, and there was a guy going, like, halt, with a serious look on his face, and his hand went up, like, don't come out here. 
So I thought, ooh, okay. There were three or four cars out there and all this commotion. You know, undercover type guys, SWAT guys loading shotguns and ARs. They were putting on vests, and I imagine they weren't putting them on to go hunting. So I'd imagine they were armored vests. Everybody's eyes were right up the hill of the van and that drive-up phone. When they started moving themselves up the hill, we moved to the very cornermost office to see what was going on. I just remember seeing these guys rushing up there. They ran up the hill, and they threw open the doors, and they grabbed some people out of the van and threw them on the parking lot. They handcuffed these guys and moved them over to the grassy area. Later that day, there was news media everywhere. This morning at approximately 8.35 a.m., two male subjects were taken into custody by the members of the Richmond Area Task Force at Perham Road and Broad Street, which is basically right behind us. Those two individuals are being questioned at this time. Police began interrogating the two suspects. The first, Edgar Rivera Garcia, had been sitting in a white minivan and talking on a drive through payphone. He claimed he was a carpenter from Mexico. The other man, Jose Morales, had been walking through the gas station's parking lot when police showed up. Neither could provide valid identification. As police interrogated Garcia and Morales, agents from the task force were listening to the recorded call over and over. They painstakingly deciphered the sniper's call, word by word. It referred to the demand from the Ponderosa letter. Option one, to put $10 million on an ATM card. Or option two, the killings would continue. Here's what they transcribed. Dearest police, call me God. Do not release to the press. Five red stars. You have our terms. They are non-negotiable. If you choose option one, you will hold a press conference stating to the media that you believe you have caught the sniper like a duck in a noose. Repeat every word exactly as you heard it. If you choose option two, be sure to remember we will not deviate. P.S. Your children are not safe. The call had to be from the killer. Nothing from the Ponderosa letter had leaked, but the caller knew about the red stars, the two options, and the threat to children. That was definitely one of the snipers on the line. Later that day, Richmond police held another press conference. Based on information we received this morning, two men were detained and questioned by local and federal authorities. These men have been turned over to representatives of the Immigration and Naturalization Services for further action. Garcia and Morales weren't the snipers. The police had arrested the wrong guys. The task force had learned that there was a second payphone on the other side of the gas station, and the sniper's call had come in from that other phone. By the time police had showed up, the snipers were already gone. They'd come so close to catching them, but the trap had failed. That afternoon, Chief Moose again communicated to the snipers through a press conference. I would like to start with a, another message. The person you called could not hear everything that you said. The audio was unclear, and we want to get it right. Call us back so that we can clearly understand. The police were trying to reestablish communication with the snipers, but they were also trying to buy time. That's because they've been following up on other leads from the letter. Here's David Reichenbaugh. Right now, we've got a whole bunch of leads that we can work on, and they were running those leads down. Those were our red-hot leads. They want $10 million on this ATM card, and the ATM card belonged to a lady, a bus driver. This is Jill Lynn Farrow, retired Greyhound bus driver. In October of 2002, my supervisor said I must call this telephone number immediately. The FBI needs to speak to me. And I, I was completely shocked and surprised that I called. And FBI agent Mac Rominger said, yes, I need to speak to you upon arrival in Flagstaff tonight. And then I had the next three hours to wonder what in the world was going on with FBI agents. <laughs> I was just, you know, very concerned. What did I do? <laughs> oh, it could have been anything. What did I do? The agents met me at the Greyhound bus terminal in Flagstaff at the bottom of the steps of my bus. And they said, please follow us into the driver lounge. And um, they said, please sit down. I said, gentlemen, I've been sitting all day. Do you mind if I stand up? And what is this about? They asked, do you remember the day your credentials went missing? And my mind instantly flashed back to that day, and I told them everything. It seemed like a typical day. I go Nogales to Tucson, and then I load the local, local bus to Phoenix, Arizona. And then I continue on from Phoenix to Flagstaff. I then took my luggage off the bus and went into the Flagstaff bus driver lounge, and I'm going through my items in my little suitcase and discovered my entire Union Pacific little black pouch was missing. My driver's license, credit cards, whatever. That was missing. And I started calling everybody, shutting everything down regarding credit cards. She canceled all of her cards except for one, 
her Bank of America Visa card. That was the only one I didn't call in about because I did not know I had it. A few weeks later, a call from Bank of America told me they had shut down and canceled that card due to fraudulent use. The card was used one time only for $12.01 at a gas station in Tacoma, Washington. Investigators now knew the credit card mentioned in the letter had been stolen in Arizona and used in Washington State. Those were now places of interest. Agents were also following up on the five phone calls that the sniper had mentioned in the letter. The letter mentioned a call to a priest in Ashland. It turned out there was only one Catholic church in the city. Police went there and spoke to the pastor, William Sullivan. Sullivan said he had received a strange call from a man with an accent he couldn't place. The man on the phone claimed he knew who the sniper was and rambled to Sullivan about a liquor store robbery in Montgomery. The man went on and on, but Sullivan didn't take it seriously. He thought it was just someone with a big imagination who'd watched too much about the snipers on TV. The task force tracked down two of the other calls that were mentioned in the letter. One had come into the Rockville Police Department, and another to the man the snipers had described as Officer Derek. As it turned out, Montgomery County Public Information Officer Derek Belisles had received a strange call a few days earlier. During the sniper crisis, we received a tremendous amount of phone calls. All the phone calls from people who wanted to talk to Chief Moose were forwarded to the media office where I answered the phone. My name is Derek Belisles, and back in 2002, I was a public information officer for the Montgomery County Police. When the FBI came to question me, I didn't know if I'd done something right or something wrong, but I went over to talk to him. On my way out of the building, I ran into Chief Moose, who said, thank you for what you've done. I really appreciate everything you're doing. And uh, I didn't know if that was my goodbye speech or whether it was something else. I had no idea. All I know is that the FBI wanted to talk to me over at the task force. When I got over to the Sniper Task Force, I met with a number of people. The ATF wanted me to come out to their van that was parked outside. Once I got in there, they put headphones on me and said, just listen and tell us what you think. And I listened to the phone call that was recorded by the Rockville City Police. Good morning. What are the people that are causing the killing in your area? Charlie, look on the terror card. It says, call me God. Do not release the threat. We have called you three times before, trying to set up negotiations. We've got no response. People have died. Yes, sir. Anything before you can ask Montgomery County Police yeah. Hotline. We're not investigating the crime. Do you like the number? The dispatcher, though, was not the person to give that information, so she did the right thing and told him to call the sniper task force. And that caller got angry and got frustrated and hung up. I listened to that phone call, and they asked me, did I recognize anything? And I said, that's exactly the same voice that I had heard on my phone call, the same tone, the same inflection, the same emphasis on certain words. The task force sat me down in a room surrounded by everybody, and they wanted to know what I had heard and who I thought the sniper might be. And I told them the information, and I also told them that it sounded like the voice of a young black male. That really startled them, because all of the profilers had said, it's probably an adult male with military history and all those types of things. So they were intrigued by why I thought it sounded like a young black male. And uh, they just threw a lot of questions at me as I told my story over and over again. The phone call to Officer Derek Belisles wasn't recorded, but this is his recollection of the call. He said, shut up and listen. I've got some information about some of your snipers, but first I need you to verify some information. So he wanted me to look at an incident that had occurred in Montgomery, Alabama, and tell him what I knew about it. As he spoke to me, he was very insistent and told me to get the information for him. I told him my name was Officer Derek because I didn't want to use my last name. I asked him to call me back in about an hour or so. After I got the phone call, the detectives there told me that there had been a shooting in Montgomery, Alabama by a liquor store where two women coming out of the store were shot and a black male was seen running from the scene of the accident. When he did call back about an hour and a half later, I told him what I had learned and then said, what can you tell me about our snipers? How can you help me after I've helped you? And he said that uh, it wasn't easy for him to talk right then because he had to find a telephone that there was no cameras watching or anything like that. And that phone call came to an abrupt end when the operator came on saying, to continue this call, please deposit more coins. And then the call abruptly stopped. At that point, the sniper task force took this information and followed it up and the pieces began to fall into place. Next time on Monster, D.C. Sniper. The Alabama incident is interesting. Ten days before shots were fired in Maryland, two clerks shot outside the ABC beverage store in Montgomery, Alabama. He was behind one of the pillars of the business, rummaging, going through a purse. The first victims of the serial sniper may have been 800 miles south of the Washington Beltway. You know, we got to push with everything we got because we don't know how long these resources are going to last. I mean, we had close to 400 FBI agents, ATF, and I know there's a limitation to that. All this is happening not in days, it's happening in hours. And now we had a very, very clear suspect to pursue by name. 
Monster DC Sniper is a 15 episode podcast hosted by Tony Harris and produced by iHeartRadio and Tenderfoot TV. Matt Frederick and Alex Williams are executive producers on behalf of iHeartRadio, alongside producers Trevor Young, Ben Kiebrick, and Josh Thane. Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright are executive producers on behalf of Tenderfoot TV, alongside producers Meredith Stedman and Christina Dana. Original music is by Makeup and Vanity Set. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the first two seasons, Atlanta Monster and Monster the Zodiac Killer. If you have questions or comments, email us at monster at iheartmedia.com, or you can call us at 1-833-285-6667. Thanks for listening.